Uh, so, what's your name? Byron Heflin, and I'm here from Atlanta. From Atlanta? Yeah. That's cool, man. Where, um, where are you from? What were you saying about the, uh, the, the lights? Oh, I, uh, when you fly on a sign, that's what we call it, what we do in fly on a sign. The lights change during traffic hours, and you got a minute and a half light, and then you got a three and a half minute light. And, uh, you know, the three and a half minute lights are the only ones you can make any money on. So the minute and a half, everybody's ready to go. You know, they see the lights changing quick, so they're just ready to go. They don't want to dig in their pockets or anything else. But the three and a half minutes where they're sitting there, they don't mind, you know. But if somebody's got to give you something, but once one gives you something, then it starts a chain reaction. That's you know, crazy. The person behind it, you got to keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's that old saying, you know. That's called uh, it's breaking yeah. the ice when yeah. the first guy gets in? Uh-huh. I know. You live, you live behind the Sam's Club? Yeah, I do. I don't know if you know it, they're putting a trail all the way down the creek. They're really? trying to run us all off the creeks so that anybody that's living on the creek. Really? Because they're putting a nature trail down through there. Oh. And there's flood ponds all around Sam's and all the way into the back back there. There's five of them. And they, for the Peachtree Creek overrun, you know, to catch the water and keep it from flooding people's houses and stuff. But all the geese and everything stop here because of the big ponds, you know. <laughs> and so the geese are beating there and well, I live back there. I was living under the bridge over here, but like I said, <laughs> I would take you down there, but they're probably doing the illicit things down there, so I wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, do people do a lot of drugs or what? Uh, yeah, most of them do. Really? Most of them do. You know? Unfortunately, most people that find themselves... <laughs> People that find themselves in this situation usually running from something. And uh, that's where they hide. Most of them hide with drugs and alcohol. You know, drugs are bad. Alcohol is the worst drug in the world. And it's legal. <laughs> yeah. you know, most people don't realize it, but alcohol every year kills more people than all other drugs combined. Really? Yes. <laughs> you know, all of the drugs combined, legal and illegal, together. Yeah. Most people don't realize it. It needs to be broadcasted. I mean, the government, <laughs> the government should be sued. And they're, you know, they're prosecuted for selling the shit. That's where they make all their money, though. That's why every government sells it. <laughs> How many people live like that? Uh, under the bridge right now, there's one. Two, three, four. You four. Guys know each other? Uh, yeah, I know all of them. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I'm I'm a litter fanatic. I can't stand. It. I pick up McDonald's parking lot. I pick up everywhere I go. I pick it up trash. Yeah. And, uh, I can't. They are a bunch of pigs down there. They're just lazy. They don't want to get up and do anything, so they just throw everything on the ground. And people give them clothes. They won't even wash clothes. They just take them off and throw them down. Put on something else, or wear them until they find something else. Uh, it's ridiculous. There's so much trash that goes into that creek for people like that. Yeah. There should be something done about it. I used to keep it clean under there. <laughs> when I came back and I went under there, and I see it. It looks like a city dump. It really does. Yeah, I saw you. I saw you picking up. The, you said you were picking up the bottles. Yeah. Yeah, I pick up everything. You know. Anything that is unsightly, I try to pick it up. Yeah. Especially if it's in the roadway, because you know, stuff flies up and hits cars and causes accidents. And I, you know, I'm just, <laughs> just me. <laughs> One of the things I do. You used to be in the military? Yeah. Um, uh, how long were you in the army? Four years. Four years? Yeah, unfortunately got booted out. Because <laughs> the commanding officer put his hands on me and I broke him up. <laughs> really? Yeah. What, what year was that? That was 74. 74? Where were you deployed? Uh, were yeah. You deployed? Uh -huh. Where? Vietnam. Yeah. We just got back. <sighs> you know, it's a uh, it's strange life out here. Everybody says, oh God, it's got to be dangerous. It's not. It's not dangerous. If you have fears, it's dangerous. But I don't fear nothing. I was fortunate my papa which is my mother's father, taught me when I was 
three and a half years old, he, not to fear anything. As he told me, he said, God made you to rule over all his creatures. He said, you have no reason to fear anything on God's green earth. <laughs> and I ain't had a sense of fear, not since. <laughs> that and I became a martial artist, that helps too, so. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a bad thing too, but I finally retired these things in 2007. <laughs> you know. You've been here for a while, haven't you? Yeah, all my life. Really? Uh, how have things changed in the next past 20 years? Woo! <laughs> Good God of mine. Tremendously. Martin Luther King was my pastor when I was a young man. You know, when really? I was a kid, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in the fourth ward, two blocks from the church, from Ebenezer. And, you know, Martin gave speeches all across this country about equal rights, nonviolent change, and everything else. Except he never gave a speech in Atlanta. He didn't have to. This was not a prejudiced city then. It is a tremendously prejudiced city now, but it's the blacks that are prejudiced against the whites. Really? Yeah. Yeah. There is a movement in the city of Atlanta to try to push the whites out. They're trying to make this the black mecca. <laughs> I mean, this is all fact. I mean, you can see it in the newspapers and everything else. You hear it a little bit on the radio. You'll never see it on TV, though. Yeah. You know, it never makes it to the TV. Because you know, the government controls the TV pretty much. <laughs> so, you feel that in this Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, uh, I probably shouldn't say some of the things I say, but that's just me. I say what I think. There are, as you know, city, this city's becoming gang ridden. And there are gangs that are trying to control these ramps. The ramps? Yeah. Really? They bring their people out here and tell you to get off the ramp. They point pistols at you, threaten you, and everything else. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Because they want their people to work around. What they're doing is they're putting crackheads out there to get the money. And then they're taking the money just give them crack. Uh, they're making a fortune doing it. You know? and, uh, this, this one's not so bad because Officer Peterson patrols this pretty well. I wasn't going to be out there long at night. You know, but I usually don't fly at night. But because I've been hurt, I ain't got no money, you know. So I was going to go out there and try it for a few lights. Didn't get enough. But Officer Peterson, who works this beat gets a lot of calls when we're out there flying there's, there's a large Jewish community here you know, Briarcliff, North Wood Hills and everything and the old ladies will call precinct and tell them hey they're out here it's holding these signs up walking up to my car and everything else and I'll tell you a cute little story right before I went to jail I was out there it was a Wednesday afternoon and I'm walking up the ramp started up the ramp and there's a lady there in a Jaguar She's an older lady, she's probably in her 70s, maybe even 80. And she's on her phone, her window's down about that much. She said, he's walking right at my car. Oh my God, he's coming at me. <laughs> she said, you've got to do something. Get down here and get him off this ramp right now. And she seen me looking at it. I just shook my head and walked on past her car. The same week, on Sunday, that same lady pulled up out there and gave me a plate of food this big ramp. Really? Yeah. After trying to get me locked up on Wednesday, she brings me a big, huge plate of homemade food on Sunday. So why, why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, just, I don't know if they're bipolar or if she's just, you know, maybe a little dementia is set in. I don't know. You know, it's just strange. A lot of people pull up and take our pictures. You know, probably 60% of the people that take my picture give me money. They don't say nothing about, you know, I'm giving you this because I took your picture. I figure they're doing it. Like, oh, I'm giving this homeless man money. And, you know, and putting it on their Facebook or something. I know stuff goes on the community bulletin boards around here. Because each community's got the little bulletin board on the web. And, you know, they push stuff like that. Maybe that's what they're doing. I don't know. I, you know. I don't have access to it, so I don't have a phone or anything anymore. So, can't afford them. <laughs> You know, used to, when I first came here, this story, this story goes back almost three years. When, uh, when I, I made myself homeless, to be honest with you, because I had two roommates and one of the roommates was a piece of shit. And it's basically been extorting the other roommate for 20 years. And I just got fed up with it. And I was, 
I was to the point where I was fixing to do something that I didn't need to do. And so I just packed up and left. I was living in East Atlanta, Norwood Park, right next to Grant Park. And I just packed up six suitcases and strapped them on a bicycle and took off. And this is where I stopped. Six suitcases on a bicycle? Yeah. Wow. I was pushed the bicycle. I couldn't ride it. I was just pushing yeah. it. And it was six suitcases on wagon. This is where I stopped, right there at that picnic table. Really? At, yeah. Eight and a half hours later. It took me eight and a half hours to get from there to here, pushing that bicycle. And I parked that bicycle right there and I sit down and people started coming up. They looking at me and seeing all the suitcases and everything else. And they would go into McDonald's and eat and come back out and give me food. I ain't asked nobody for nothing. I've, it's always been hard for me to ask somebody for something. I used to be well. The government took everything, but that's another story. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, the following morning, I got up, I slept right there, <laughs> right up under that big oak tree right there. And that's where I wound up building that little cabin back there. And yeah, we got tore down, the police tore down. But I lived there for 18 months, 19 months, 19 months, and they never got a complaint from nobody. <laughs> you know, people see me come and go and everything else, and you couldn't see my place back there. I just started cleaning up over there because people, while I was gone, had moved back to Andrews. Piles of clothes and trash and everything else, and I'm putting it all in a big hole back there. And I told you, I, I can't stand it. <laughs> Although I'm not living there anymore, I still, if I can see it walking by, I don't want to, you know, I clean it up. That's what I've been doing. Yeah. The people in this community, for the most part, are pretty good people. They really are. You gave me a lot of help. I guess that's why I came back. I didn't you know when I got out of jail. Yeah, nothing. I had a lot of stuff under the bridge. I had two lawnmowers. I had all my tools and everything else. And of course they say, oh, it got washed away. And I can get washed away. Y'all saw my shit. <laughs> you know, but they're crackheads. You expect. I shouldn't should call nobody a crack, but that's what they are. You know, they, they dedicate their whole life to smoking crack. I told them, I said, y'all are idiots. Cocaine doesn't get you high. It makes you think you're high for one minute. <laughs> you know, cocaine is an anesthetic. It just makes you think you're high. And you say, oh, damn, I ain't no high. Let me do another one. <laughs> I said, if you're going to do a drug, do a real drug. Do some speed or something. Something that's going to get you going now. Y'all you know, doing something that just makes you think, oh, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm just like, oh yeah, straightforward with everything I say. These people spend all day long chasing a high, most of them. That is not a high, you know. They spend crack is the biggest force on the general population that I've ever seen. You know, it just makes people think they're high for a second and then they want to get it again, you know. There is, there's a woman out here that she came down to this side a little over a year ago. She used to be up on the the road. She's aged 10 years in a year. In a year? In a year, she's aged at least 10 years. Do you okay? Yeah. She spends all day long, will not buy cigarettes, will not buy food. People try to buy her food. Uh, she said, well, my, my stomach's upset. Can you just give me the money? And I'll get it in a little bit. Stuff like that. You should run and get back. And then they come back to me because I cook. I cook my food and everything else. I go to the church, they give me food, and I cook my foods and everything. When I've got gas, I'm out of gas right now. But, uh, they don't cook anything. They don't. They, if they get anything, it's because somebody hands it to them. You know, they won't buy no food, won't buy no cigarettes, won't buy anything. They won't even buy toilet paper. <laughs> you know, that's how dedicated there are to a drug that's not really a drug. <laughs> it's an anesthetic. It's sad, but that's how they hide. Most of them that smoke crack drink alcohol too, because they're mad because they're not high, so they don't want to get drunk. <laughs> you can't afford it. Yeah, it's crazy. What's it like when it rains? Huh?
for most people it's pretty bad. Uh, if you want to walk back to my camp, I'll take you back here and show you yeah. the results of where I put my tent. Uh, it gets water in it. And it's because it's a low spot under it. And so I'm, 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 I'm going to have to move it because they're coming down with that trail. I'm going to move over here. Pretty close to the Marriott. I guess they're going to run me out too. But, <laughs> but that's the only place I got to, I can get to right now. I mean, I, you know, until this foot gets a little better, I can't really move everything because I got a lot of junk back there. There's a friend of mine that was living back there. And he basically gave me the tent, but he still got a lot of stuff back there. And uh, he came got some today. I don't know when he'll be back to get the rest of it. But he's got bikes and everything back there chained up. But uh, everything else is mine. And everything's soaking wet, so I got stuff hanging everywhere. <laughs> you know, I don't know how good your camera's gonna work in the dark back there, but. I, I think it'll be good. Oh, okay. You, 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 wanna, you wanna finish up and go check it out? Yeah, yeah we'll do that. I'm gonna pause it real quick. All right, let's see. I think we're good. Cool, man. We're back. Huh? We're back. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna tell you about my bird. I told you that I slept here the first night and I made myself homeless. The next morning, what woke me up was this loud shrill right, right in there. It was like busting my ears. And I opened my eyes and I look up and 12 feet above me, this peregrine falcon. Yeah, he looks down at me, he reaches down to his talons and pulls off a piece of meat and drops it over my chest. Yeah, and I picked the meat up and I looked at it and he's looking at me like, what's up? You hungry? You dying? What? And I realized in that instant, this bird is trying to help me. He thinks I'm hurt. I said, my God. And I just took and threw a piece of meat in my mouth and swallowed it. And he's picks the talon up and he pulls another piece off and I see what it is, it's a chipmunk. But it didn't matter, I understood what the bird was doing. This bird was trying to help me, he was trying to save my life, he thought I was injured. Me and that bird have been together ever since. <laughs> that bird, he's, he's now daddy, he had a baby last year. Yeah. He found him a mate and he had a baby. So we don't spend a whole lot of time together but he comes by at least twice a day and checks on me. You know, he lives, mm -hmm. he had a tall tree right there on the rocks. A big tall tree back there. One well, it's only it looks like this much taller than the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's where he lives. Him, his wife, and his kid. I guess the kid just turned a year old, so he should be on his own now. But he's still running around with his daddy every day. So, <laughs> yeah. but this bird, he's an amazing bird. I mean, he comes, he'll land here on the table or on the tree limb, and he'll stand there. And I just interact with him. I talk to him. I call him Baby. That's what I named him, Baby. And He'll just sit there and people watch him. This bird's listening to him. This is crazy. <laughs> it's just, you know, the interaction. I know the bird doesn't understand me. I don't understand him. It's just the interaction between us. And it's like, he'll just sit there, yeah, okay. You know, you see him bobbing his head and everything else when I'm talking. <laughs> and it's really cool. He's an amazing animal. And peregrine falcons are known to befriend people. But I never knew that they would try to save someone like that. It was just... I mean, in the instant that I realized what he was doing, it, it really got to me, it really did. And I don't know how old he is, but he's probably, I would say three or four years old because this is his first mate and his first child. You could tell, you know. But he's cool, he's really cool. And I still ain't named the, the, his young yet, but I don't know what to name him. You know? <laughs> The youngin and his wife, that pile, that light pole right there is about as close as she's ever got to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she just, she's standoffish. Usually, for the first five or six months that they were together, she would just circle around, wait on him, you know, while he was down interacting with me. It was really, really crazy. And right out there on the ramp, he came down one day, blush, and ran right on the uh, guardrail right next to me, you know. Cause I'd walked over to get a drink of water and he just, poof, <laughs> and he landed and she landed on the light pole right there and just watched. And that's the closest she's ever got to me. And she only got that close once. That's yeah. Now these, the, uh, the youngest still hasn't even tried to approach her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to share that with you. I don't know if you know this, 
There's every kind of wildlife on this creek. Every kind of wildlife really? in Georgia is on that creek. Really? And it lives, they live in that 80 to 90 foot corridor that is the creek. Yeah. There's bear, deer, bear? ponies. Yeah. Really? Wild ponies, beaver, raccoons, possums, squirrels, rabbits, every kind of snake native to Georgia. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you wouldn't believe it. It's just, and I'm amazed to watch them because they interact with me now. They see me, they don't even think nothing about it. They see somebody else, they get the hell on, especially the deer. The deer will jump and take off if they see somebody else. Now they see me, they don't even shake, they don't even just go right on about their business <laughs> because they know I'm not going to hurt them. It's really amazing that wildlife confines itself to that creek like that because they have to, you know. <laughs> the only I seen when I was in jail, unfortunately, I seen on TV where one of the bears a little north of here had come out into a neighborhood and was tearing some trash cans up because all the smell, you know. And so that's, you know, they're probably going to tranquilize him and take him up north or something, but they still bear everywhere. There's bear right down there. Right down there. <laughs> this, this, not this kind of medium complex, but there's another one. You go across the bridge right here. And right to where you see those white lights up there, yeah. past the Holiday Inn, there's a condominium complex back there. Yeah. And the bear lives right under the bridge that goes in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they people don't have no clue. Don't even know. It. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would never tell wildlife people because they don't need to fuck with you. He'll fuck with nobody. He's a male. And he's probably about 240 pounds. You know, our black bears don't, don't get big. Yeah. The 300 pound black bears are big, pretty good size black bear. But he's, he's a little slim. He don't eat enough. <laughs> he, he, he eats mostly blackberries and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, because we've got blackberries and muscadines and skeptodines all up and down this creek. So that's what he does. He travels up and down there eating them all day long. Yeah. Hey, you want I just want to share this with you too, to tell you how these animals live. There's a buck who lives probably 90 feet from where the bear does. And he's got three, he had four does, but one got killed last year right over here. But he will only mate with one of them each year because he knows he can't have the population that big. He calls his own population. I said, this is amazing. This deer knows to keep the population down. <laughs> yeah. There's not enough resources for no, they were right. So he knows I can't do it but once. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm, I'm really amazed at how the animals control themselves. Uh, I'm going to share one more animal story with you real quick. I told you these ponds, retention ponds are up through here. There's six beaver that live in the very last one. There was six. We had a flood last year. I mean, it was the water was all the way up to the bridge. And the old beaver, I called him old man because he was old. He was gray. He was he was a big old beaver. He was a big old beaver. He was probably 70 pounds because he was this big around. He was a huge beaver. He got overwhelmed by the water. And there's inlets from uh, and outlets from the uh, Storm drains, storm drains. He got pushed into a storm drain and wound up coming out right here, right there. And he come out of the drain, and when he come out of the drain and wobbled into the street, bam, he got run over. Really? Yeah. I don't know how old he was, but he was, a, I call him the paddle, the tail on the beaver. Yeah. His paddle was nine and three quarter inches long. I've never seen one that big, never. I mean, it's nine and three quarter inches long and about that wide. I've never seen a paddle that big. I've seen some big beaver. I've never seen one as big as him. But after that beaver got killed, the other five beavers did not leave that lake up there for three months. They were like in the morning. <laughs> you know, I guess they were sitting there waiting on him to come back. They didn't know he was splattered all over the road. You know, we got him out of the road and put him in a bag. And asked McDonald's if we could put him in the dumpster and they said, yeah, put him in there. I, as you see, I love I love wildlife. I just wanted to share those stories with you. It's part of the interesting life here. <laughs> that is, that is, that is so interesting. 
All right. I, I guess we cut off here if you want to. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah.